June 6, 1992 was the eve of my 21st birthday, and my dear friend Carrie Stacy, who's like a sister to me, was visiting me in Dublin, where I lived. Carrie had just graduated from Smith College, and she didn't have any plans for what came next in her life, and I had just finished my third year of college as a visiting student at Trinity, and I had learned right before Carrie arrived that I would not be returning to Smith College like I thought I would. Um, it's no fault of my own. It was beyond my control. I had a lot of anger and a lot of grief, but I also had no plans for what was going to come next. So Carrie and I were sort of together staring into the abyss, which in this case had taken the form of a map, because we had decided that the question needing answered was not what would we do, but where would we go? So there we sat, shoulder to shoulder, crouched in the floor of my bedroom over, as I recall, a map of the United States. <laughs> I believe that one of us put our arms over the parts where we didn't want to live, and the other closed her eyes and pointed, and the universe answered, Albuquerque. <laughs> We'll move to Albuquerque and get kittens. That was the whole plan. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so a few months later, we arrive in Albuquerque. <laughs> um, she from Portland, Oregon, me from Birmingham, Alabama. I had on me $700 and all the clothes I owned in a duffel bag, also a boom box and cassettes because this was 1992. We couldn't find a place to live right away. So I believe uh, it was the Economy Inn, right, Carrie? The Economy Inn on Route, <laughs> on route 66. Um, lucky for us, they had a weekly rate because we were there for a few months. And <laughs> in the next stroke of luck, I got a job right away because even with a weekly rate, $700 only goes so far. Um, the job was at 7-Eleven. It was about two miles down. I had to be there at 5.40 in the morning, which meant leaving at 5.15. It was a long walk with no car. So I'm walking. I don't know if it would be the same today as it was then. It took me about a week to start carrying a switchblade. Um, so I had a lot of time to think. And what I'm thinking, gripping my knife, is that it's two hours later in Massachusetts and my classmates are still asleep. And when I embarked on my college career, I intended to pursue medicine, Dr. Hahn. <laughs> and then I got to Smith and I fell in love with psychology and sociology. I was kind of a do-gooder, <laughs> smarty pants, naive for sure. So I'm not going to lie, there was self-pity on that walk, absolutely. But more than that, there was like this whiplash level of disorientation. I was like, what the hell happened? I was going to be a doctor, maybe a social worker. How is it that I am walking west every morning down Route 66, gripping a knife in the dark? But then, like a beacon in the desert, <laughs> the lights of the convenience store, <laughs> and the swish of the automatic doors, and then, magically, I'm at work. <laughs> and this particular franchise is um, nestled in the heart of this little enclave of small weekly rate motels, which apparently is a thing in Albuquerque. And they served as the home base for this um, sort of community of intermittently homeless people that were all really kind of tightly knit, though it was kind of a rotating group of people, kind of bound together by struggle, really. They were all affected by pretty wrenching poverty and a lot of chronic illness and untreated mental illness. Um, but I got to know them all really well, their names and their relationships and their stories. And um, you, 
you know 7-Eleven, we all know 7-Eleven. This was 7-Eleven. <laughs> uh, but better than 7-Eleven, we were also a gas station and we also sold hard liquor and <laughs> we, we also had a deli. I, honest to God, made sandwiches every day with loaves of Wonder Bread and tubs of industrially produced egg salad in between keeping the coffee carafes running and ringing up people's gas. Um, I worked alone in the store every day. so. For the people whose motels were adjacent to the 7-Eleven, and there were several of them, I was running the thing that was their gas station, their grocery store, their post office, because we sold stamps, their bank, because we sold money orders, their restaurant, because hot dogs, nachos, deli sandwiches, the community center, the liquor store, all of it, you know? And then also, because we're on Route 66, there's this huge flow of commuter traffic. And of course, I knew all those people by name, too, because people are ridiculously regular in their commuting habits. It's a really interesting piece to know. And the most interesting and kind of terrifying part of every day was the section between 6.45 and 7.15 a.m. because liquor sales began at 7 a.m. every day, legally. So at about 6.45, two lines would start to form in the store. <laughs> Do you know where this is going? One, one at the back, where the, where the beer cooler is with a chain around the, the handle until I unlock it, and one at the front next to the counter because the hard liquor is up by me. And that would be okay, except this is also when the commuter traffic really picks up. And so the store starts to get crowded, and people in a hurry really don't like to be close to other people, especially when the people in line for liquor for the most part, are wearing dirty clothes and their pockets are heavy with nickels and dimes that they mostly got from panhandling to buy their hooch. And the people getting their coffee and their newspapers and wanting to pay for their gas are mostly in suits. So there's a lot of tension. And you know in retail, you know where the tension goes, right? Ultimately, it's going to explode. And most, most of the time, when it explodes, it's the person behind the counter who's going to catch it. Um, and I know all of these people's names. None of these people are strangers to me. And the thing that hits me over and over again, it, and it's a daily event, some, some man loses his temper every day, right? Nine times out of 10, it's a guy in a suit, red in the face, shouting obscenities at me across the counter. Every day this happens. I notice that. <laughs> A nice turn of events, and there are tons of witnesses, it's always a full store. A nice turn of events is that usually when angry man leaves, somebody behind him leans across the counter and looks me in the eye and says, are you okay? And you know what, nine times out of 10, that person has on dirty clothes and a lot of nickels and dimes in his pockets. And that left a mark. And I'd be lying if I said that that didn't affect my worldview still today. Outside of 7-Eleven, um, my life and our lives continued much as you might imagine that they did. Carrie and I did move out of the economy in. <laughs> we found this really fantastic duplex on Princeton Street. We both thought it was pretty funny that we went from Smith College to Princeton Street. Um, <laughs> It was pistachio green, and we got two tiny and adorable kittens, and both of them ultimately lived almost 20 years old, which was fantastic. We made friends, we threw parties, we took fantastic care of each other. Um, we drove each other crazy in the usual ways. I drove her crazy in unusual ways. I had this inability to take off my 7-Eleven smock when I get home every afternoon. <laughs> It's kind of a running joke in our relationship, even today. Um, and all I can say about that when I look back on it, really, is that sometimes when grief and anger are too raw and too unexamined, it makes you do really oddball things. So 
I'm sorry, Carrie, that was kind of a weird one. Uh, <laughs> but back at work, I was every morning and taking care of my customers. There was John, the Korean war vet that I saw stealing sandwiches my first week on the job, and I just couldn't take it. I mean, he fought a war for his country, and he had no teeth. And I noticed it was always egg salad that he took because he couldn't chew that much. So I would always make a couple of extra for him, and I'd stick them between the Slurpee machine and the coffee carafes where I couldn't see when I was facing the register. And when I saw him coming, that's where I'd stick them. And by the time he'd made a lap and came around front, I'd turn around and make sure they were gone, and they always were. It was an unspoken agreement. I felt good about him taking what was meant for him. And there was Chelsea, who would sneak into the bathroom to shoot up and stay there for half a day, which wouldn't have been that big of a deal, except her toddler daughter was always in the store when she did that. So I spent a lot of shifts with Chelsea's toddler daughter behind the counter with me and I'd give her cups to stack. And it was okay, because as long as her toddler was with me behind the counter, I knew she was okay. And yes, I called DHS, and I never saw them come, but while I was there, I knew she was okay. And it wasn't just me taking care of them, it really wasn't. My second week at 7-Eleven, Michael, who was one of the guys who had pretty untreated mental illness, got right in my face and said, what? You walk down Central in the dark by yourself? That's not safe. You can't do that. And I said, well, <laughs> okay, Michael, but I've got to get to work, right? He said, well, I'm going to watch for you. And I said, okay, okay, you do that, buddy. Um, and you know what? Every freaking day that I worked there, the whole time that I worked there, as soon as 7-Eleven came into view, I could see Michael standing on the corner with a flashlight the whole time I was there. I don't know what time he left his room. I never asked, but he was always there. He never failed. Um, so I never did graduate. And the truth is I still hate that. But it occurred to me recently that my tenure at 7-Eleven was eight months. I started in a September and I wrapped up in May. And nobody could say it wasn't educational. <laughs> and I was kind of working in my desired field by that time. <laughs> and when I listen to people reflect on the things that they cherish most about their college experiences, I hear some themes. And the themes that I hear are new experiences. Yeah, I got that. And learning to take care of themselves, check me out with a switchblade, <laughs> and enduring friendships. I think we knocked it out of the park. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs>